Can you hear me? Can you boost that sound a little bit? I can't even hear myself. There we go. All right, thank you. Welcome once again to another exciting edition of the Peaceful Solution Character Education Program Teacher Certification Training Course. Say that three times as fast as you can. Whether you're here at the headquarters or you're joining us on the internet, please be seated and thank you for joining us. I would remind you that uh, the, uh, the book that we're covering right now is Respect. And if you uh, are on joining us over the uh, internet, you can click on the top of the Facebook page there and you should be able to uh, uh, download the Respect Teacher's Manual. There's other manuals up there, but we're now on the fourth manual in the Intermediate Series, uh, the Respect Unit. We're going to be picking up in chapter, is it chapter three? Chapter three. Chapter three. And uh, it's called Respect Others. That's where we're going to be picking up tonight on page 51, if you have a manual. And uh, let's see. <clears throat> Chris, the previous teacher, left off on, he started the first uh, paragraph there on, on page 51. Uh, regarding respect others. He had just gotten through going over our uh, lesson plan, which begins on lesson plan three, page C. Uh, he went through all the, uh, the first, he covered the first two steps of, and the purpose of obje an objective of the lesson. And uh, we're gonna have to go back over that, at least step two again, just to remind ourselves where we left off a few days ago. Um, as you know, uh, how much do you remember from one day, two days, three days ago? Well, if it's only one day, you only remember about 10% of what you heard the day before, so, which means we don't remember anything that we learned three days ago, right? No, you learned, you remember something, but you don't remember a lot. So we're going to go back over some of the things, and we'll even probably, um, uh, uh, emphasize and expound upon some of the points that Chris uh, previously made uh, when he began this chapter of respect others. So we'll go ahead and get to it. I want to thank all my uh, my uh, uh, production team tonight, getting the glasses I forgot, getting the uh, slideshow downloaded that I couldn't down download. It's a team effort here at the Peaceful Solution. I probably even had somebody straighten my tie up. Okay, what I didn't do is clean my glasses, but we'll get through this somehow. I see a little bit of fog there. All right, so let's go ahead and go back to procedure or lesson plan page three, a lesson plan three page C, and let's just go over the procedure we're in and then we'll cover a little bit where Chris left off, review a little bit. It says, tell students that they will explore several ways they can show respect for others and they will also learn that respect is the foundation of all positive interactions. And then it says, have students turn to pages 51 and 52 in their handbook and read the sections entitled Introduction and I have a responsibility to show respect to everyone. Have students do the accompanying exercise on page 52 and allow time for students to share their answers with the class. Stress that fundamental respect and courtesy contribute to a civil society. Okay, and we'll be talking about that word civil a little bit as well as we proceed on in the lesson. So having gone over that, let's go over to page 51. And uh, if you could put up the first visual I have for those that, you know, visuals are helpful to some people. If some people are visual learners. Uh, but also we have people that don't have manuals possibly in foreign countries and other in, in other areas and this kind of will help them with where we left off on page 51 at the top it says respect others the benefits are unlimited the peaceful solution and if you see that picture of that beautiful uh, looks like a, a lake small lake small pond you know that could be your backyard if everybody practiced the peaceful solution character education program to its fullest, everybody in the world was being taught and everybody was practicing, 
You know, we could eliminate the need for wars, bombs that cost billions of dollars. You know, I was reading about that, uh, uh, the Chinese spy balloon that was shot down recently. And uh, uh, not the spy balloon, but the one in, uh, I think it was in Montana, where they shot at it and they missed it the first time. And the missile that they shot at it was a 400000 400, or $400 million missile. <laughs> Cost them $400 million to make this one missile, and they missed. <laughs> okay? Do you know what we could have done with that money in the Peaceful Solution Character Education Program? We could have taught everyone in the world multiple times over you know how they talk about you could destroy the world multiple times over with their bombs? Well, we could have taught the world multiple times over, got everyone books, provided everyone all everything they needed, teachers, everything, to get this job done. Well, if you put that picture back up one more time, I want to just give you that reminder that that could be your backyard right there. If everyone was tr is training for peace and, and, and practicing peace, we could have a beautiful productive world where the benefits would be unlimited to everyone. It would be voluptuous, voluptuous, luxurious living for everybody. Because we wouldn't have the need to pay taxes, you know, taxes and more taxes and more taxes for social programs, for war, for abortions, or whatever else they're spending it on. We could actually use it to bring peace and productivity and build the world up to a beautiful, pristine uh, state that you see right there in that picture. I would love for that to be in my backyard, you know. I really love cherry trees, cherry blossoms. I used to like going to Washington, D.C. in the springtime because that's what the trees look like around that time of year. Now, don't worry, Chris. I'm not planning any trips. Chris doesn't like going there. He told you the last time, right? Okay, so anyway, let's go ahead and uh, let me see what I need to do next. Okay, I need to read... Uh, where it says, Chapter 3, Respect to Others, Introduction. And then this is, Chris read this, but we'll go over it one more time. It says, How many people have you had contact with today? Did you interact with family members? Did you walk with friends to school, or did you take the school bus? If you live in a big city, you probably saw hundreds of people on your way to school. We see so many people every day. Well, well first, first of all, I'll put up the visual, that I next visual. This is the typical sidewalk in New York City on a typical work day. Wow. All right? <laughs> you think you got traffic in your area. <laughs> uh, that's somebody's sidewalk. And I was reading, or that's a New York City sidewalk. And, you know, I was reading yesterday when I was looking for a picture for this. It said the sidewalks in New York City are so crowded that people have to walk in the street now. They actually have to walk in streets which is, you know, pretty dangerous when you have speeding cars going by. But they're very crowded. But look at that sea of people. And, you know, when we look at all those people, you know, we see so many that we tend to not put any value on each one of those people you're seeing in that picture. But everybody that's in that picture is a mother, a father, a son, a daughter, a worker, you know, possibly, uh, uh, you know, I mean, they all have their talents. They all have their hopes and dreams. They all have their own life. They all have the need to be, to have friends and family. And they have the need to be treated with respect, with honor, with dignity. All of these people, even the people that we don't know, you know, and we don't tend to, when we see a, a lot of people like that, we really tend to forget that. And that's what I want everyone to think about, what the Peaceful Solution wants us to think about, is we see so many people every day that we sometimes we forget that every person we see has value to them. They have value. And they're important. Everybody is. Regardless of whether we know them or we don't know them, how short they are, how tall they are, how skinny or overweight they are, doesn't matter. Whether they have one eye or two eyes or no eyes, Everybody can contribute to society. Everybody can build a positive character and become a productive member of our society. Everybody can. Now, 
It says here on page 51, that last sentence in the first paragraph says, we see so many people every day that we, sometimes we forget that every person we see has value. What about the people we can't see, you know? <laughs> what about, and what about, let's start with other countries. Let's put up that next visual. We just had a, a, a 7.5 magnitude, 7.8 in Syria, magnitude earthquake back in uh, last last month, December, or I think it was 2-6 uh, two, of 2023, where tens of thousands of people died in these earthquakes. Tens of thousands. And, you know, the tendency, and I'm not going to, I'm, I'm, I'm going to, I'm going to tell you of my own experience, okay, as a teacher. When I was younger, before I actually learned to start looking at people differently and to value people for for who they are and for what they believe and what they, you know, their different uh, 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 aspects of their upbringing, I would have looked looked at these pictures in this particular slide, and I would have probably just thought, those people, you know, they don't really matter. You know, these are people on the other side of the world. They don't even have the, they don't dress like I do. They they probably don't even, you know, they probably have a different religion than I got. I mean, who's, you know, cares about them. They're probably suffering because they're not worshiping the God I worship, you know, or whatever. You know, that's probably what I used to think. Okay. And, uh, but look at those, look at the devastation, you know, in these pictures. You just see nothing but. There's nothing left for these people, and, you know. They're they're crying and they're and they're just in awe and shock over this 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 horrific event that destroyed their lives. Destroyed at least at least they made it out with their life, but it destroyed their property, and they probably lost a lot of loved ones because thousands of people died. Well, you know, this was in the news for a few days, and it was sporadic. I noticed it was very sporadic coverage. It wasn't really, you know. If it had been this magnitude earthquake in this country, <laughs> oh man, we'd probably still be hearing about it. It'd still be the top story, you know, at least till the next disaster came around. But, but it reminded me, you know, that's a huge earthquake. That's almost 8.0 on the Richter scale. Now, if you go to the next slide, a little closer to home, when I was about a year and a half in this very town right here, Anchorage, Alaska, in the 1964 earthquake, we had a 9.2 magnitude, which was the largest recorded earthquake in North American history, but it's also the second lar most powerful earthquake in world history since they've been keeping track on the Richter scale. Yes, I actually lived through that. Can you believe only 131 people died in that earthquake? That avenue you see, 4th Avenue right there, sank 10 or 15 feet under. That used to be a street. And that picture on the right used to be a subdivision. Whole homes were swallowed up. The only th reason people lived through a lot of this was because it was 5.30 in the afternoon and people were at work and they weren't really at home yet. This had been later at night or early in the morning. There would have been a lot more. And this was just Anchorage, Alaska, but all throughout Alaska. You know, this earthquake was so powerful, it was felt in South Africa. The effects said that the well water was, the people's well water was moving around. The effects went all over. In California, somebody, a, few, a couple of people died, I think, even in California from this very earthquake here in Alaska reason I bring that up is something like this is spoken about for years and years and years and years and nobody forgets it but the that Tur that earthquake in Turkey and the one in Syria that'll be forgotten they already forgot it for the most part you don't hear much about it anymore because they're not us right so we need to think about that now I'm going to read you that that 
that ending sentence in the first paragraph one more time before we go to the next visual, because I want your mind to be focused on people we can't see. It says, we see so many people every day that sometimes we forget that every person we see has value. Yes, but what about those we can't see? What about those we can't see? Let's go to the next slide. What about that baby in the mother's womb that you can't see? They have value. Now, I want to talk to you a little bit about something about that because I believe that a lot of people that are out in front of the Supreme Court building with picket signs that are quote-unquote pro-abortion, most of them are not. Most of them are paid to be out there with signs. They're being paid by somebody to go out there and be activists. <laughs> because most of them don't even really believe half the things they're saying. And the other half that are saying it They've been indoctrinated by certain teachings in the public school system that's made them believe that a child is not really a person or a fetus or a, some, a baby in a mother's womb is not a person until they're born. <laughs> so I, I want to throw a few, few things out there. I don't want to be controversial, but I want to be educational. I want to throw a few things out there to get us to think a little more about that concept because we tend to think that unborn humans are different from other humans. That's what we're being told. But let's read. I went to this website. It's uh, MCCL, and they're a pro-life pro, pro uh, life website. And I wanted to see some of the the reasoning they were using for uh, being anti-abortion. And I want you to consider these so that you have them in your mind so when you're making a decision on whether you think something's right or wrong, you can take these things into consideration. And it said, uh, unborn, it says justice. All human beings have human rights or should have human rights. It says unborn humans are different from most born humans in a number of ways. But those differences aren't relevant to whether or not someone has rights. Unborn children might look different from older human beings, but appearance has nothing to do with value. Appearance has nothing to do with value, unless, of course, you're buying art. You know, remember, some people might look at a painting and they might, wow, I'll pay $500,000 for that thing. And the next guy's like, you know, I wouldn't pay five cents for that thing. Well, beauty's in the eye of the beholder. One man's drunk's another man's treasure. Remember, we went over that a few pages ago. But not with people. It says, unborn children are less, de less physically and mentally developed, but toddlers are less developed than teenagers. And that doesn't make them any less important. Now think about what they just said. An unborn child is not developed physically and mentally yet, right? So it's not as developed as a toddler. So does that make it less important than the toddler? Because the toddler is not as developed and as mentally capable and educated like a teenager is. Does that make it less valuable than the teenager? No. Ask your parents. They'll tell you. <laughs> hey, Mom. You know, you younger people, ask your ask your mom, ask your dad, hey, am I not important because I'm not as old as so-and-so in your family? They won't agree with that. They'll, they'll say, no, you're just as important as everybody in this family. Okay? Now it says, unborn, I'm sorry, unborn children are dependent on someone else, but so are newborn children and many people with disabilities. Okay? Do we kill them because they have disabilities? Because we have to take care of them? I know many parents that have children that suffer from various birth defects, and their parents 
nurture and care for them and do everything they can to help them in every way. Do they think they're less valuable than someone else? Do they treat them as they're less valuable? No. Okay, so that's their first point about their first point about justice for human beings. Let's go to the next uh, visual. They said, historically, every single attempt to divide humanity and those who have rights and those who are expendable has proven to be a big, colossal mistake. It says, and the truth is that we have human rights simply because we're human, not because of what we look like or what we can do or what others think of us or feel about us, but rather because of what the kind of being we are. That's why every human being matters, and every human being matters equally. And they've tried, as you see here in the uh, uh, Holocaust, you know, in Nazi Germany, they were killing certain, certain groups, you know, whether they were Hebrew people or whether they were... Uh, uh, I think there was gays, there was uh, homosexuals, there was uh, uh, Jehovah Witnesses, there was different groups that they were eliminating because in their mind, well, they're not as important as us. And that's the same mindset that we have about the human baby or about the human baby. Well, I'm not saying we, I'm saying people that are pro-abortion say, well, they're not as important as us. They're not as developed as us. They don't have rights like you do. We'll, we'll see. Where as we progress, we'll get a little more information. Um, oh, boy. <laughs> I'm, I'm going to see if I can read this next slide. I'm having trouble reading some of them because I can't see the writing for some reason. Um uh, Note to self, do not use white letters on a white background. <laughs> right? <laughs> well, let me see if I can, let's go to the next slide and I'll try to, uh, I'll try to ad-lib a little bit. Can you read that? Okay. I'll try to ad-lib a little bit because I cannot read it, but I can, I can basically remember what the slide says. And basically what it's saying is, uh, some people say that, you know, people that are pro-life are imposing their view on other people by being pro-life. They're imposing their view on people that think abortion should be legal. But that's not, and they call that personal opposition. You know, some people have personal opposition to abortion but they say, well, I personally oppose it, but I'm not going to, you know, make waves about it. I don't want to impose my position or my view on somebody else. I'll just keep it to myself. But would you say the same thing about sex trafficking? Would you say the same thing about child molestation? Would you say, well, I don't believe in child molestation, but, you know, you know, if people want to do that, that's up to them. I'll just keep my opinion to myself. Would you say it then? No. Would you not voice your personal opposition to anything like that? If, if uh, murder is illegal, would you say, well, personally, I'm opposed to murder, but, you know, if everyone wants to murder people, that's okay. I just, you know, I just, just let them do what they're going to do, but I don't want to impose my beliefs on them. <laughs> I mean, how silly is that, right? But why is it a personal opposition? Why is personal opposition a big deal when it comes to abortion all of a sudden? <laughs> Look, if you personally oppose one thing that's immoral, shouldn't you personally oppose everything that's immoral? Remember, immoral means it brings harm to you, your neighbor, property, right? If it's not moral, that means it brings harm. Now, and we can all agree that abortion brings harm to somebody, right? It brings harm to the unborn, right? All right, let's go to uh, the next slide. This one 
is another reason that uh, many people or pro-abortion people will say, well, you're forcing your religion on us by opposing what we're doing. You're forcing your religion. But uh, many people, you know, it's scientific fact that even science and doctors say that the fetus is a human being, <laughs> right? So it's not a religious, it's not a religious argument at all. Even science tells you that a human fetus is, it's a human being, okay? It's just not born yet. And that it's, it's living, it's a living organism, okay? Now, uh, let me ask you a question about forcing religion. You see that $100 bill that says in God we trust on it? If your boss said it was time for payday and he gave you two of those, would you say, hey, I don't want that. Don't force that religion on me. Because it says in God we trust on it. Would you say that? I haven't seen anybody opposing getting paid with those bills that say in God we trust. Have you? But isn't that imposing your religion on somebody? Oh, no, not in that case, right? In that case, give me all you can give me. You see, these are the arguments that really can be shot down. And, you know, think about it. Think about Martin Luther King. It tells you to think about Martin Luther King. He was a preacher. Martin Luther King. And he was a part of the civil rights movement in the 1960s that made it possible for blacks to be able to ride on buses and with segregation uh, disappeared and all that other stuff, right? Was he not a religious? Wasn't his ideas based on a religion? A lot of them were. But people listened to him. They didn't have a problem with that, right? Because what he taught was basic moral values, you know, like, uh, you know, people uh, shouldn't be judged by the color of their skin, but by the content of their character. Isn't that what we teach? <laughs> I mean, the peaceful solution says the same thing. We shouldn't judge anyone based on how they look or appear. We need to get to know that person. We need to get to know their, and even, and even if, you know, most people you meet, have they been taught the Peaceful Solution Character Education Program yet? So shouldn't you be willing to educate them and help them? So even if they don't meet the standard of the Peaceful Solution yet, well, of course they don't, right? They haven't been taught yet. So we need to be willing to teach them, too, and give them time to, to grow and learn and practice and, and become the best person they can be, right? But that's not forcing religion on anybody, okay? And I'm sure you can think of many, many other ideas. What about Christmas? <laughs> Christmas is a religious holiday, but I don't hear them complaining about that. They're all out there shopping. The people that are against abortion, they're all joining in on that holiday. So, you know, what is it that, why is it that abortion is always forcing religion on somebody? Why is that? Let's go to the next slide. Here's the next argument. It's called bodily autonomy. In other words, I can do with my body whatever I choose. My body, my choice. Right? You heard that? My body, my choice? Well, I agree completely. My body, my choice. That baby that's in your belly is not your body. That's their body. That's their body. Where's their choice? Shouldn't they have a choice? Now, what do you think that baby would choose if he could speak for himself? Would he want you to get rid of him, or do you think he'd want an opportunity to live? Yeah. I don't know any baby that would want to choose to, you know, yeah, go ahead and kill me. I'm not interested in coming out and enjoying life and you know really where's his choice my body my choice respect their bodies and rights of others 
just like you respect your rights. Right? That's what we need to do. So those are just some of the things I want you to think about when you think about this argument of, you know, whether abortion is moral or immoral. First of all, it'd be real simple if you're in the peaceful solution. You would know automatically it can't be moral because we've already defined what moral means. Moral means it doesn't break the rules. It's fair and just and equitable for everyone, for all life. We teach the value of all life. We teach you to value microorganisms. Have you noticed that? A microorganism is something you cannot see. You can't see it, but you value it. You're being taught to value it because you're seeing how important that microorganism is to help us bring rain, uh, uh, you know, to make the soil productive, to grow crops. The microorganisms do many, many jobs for us. We can't see them, but we still value them. So we need to value that little baby that's not born yet, too. He doesn't have, he or she doesn't have a voice. They can't speak for themselves. And you know, one thing before I move on that I've always kind of wondered about pro-abortion advocates, okay, is if their parent had the same mentality or the same thought process that they're displaying, where would they be? It's kind of like people that, that, that say that we need to depopulate the earth. There's too many people. It's like, well, why aren't they volunteering to go first, you know? <laughs> why aren't they volunteering to, and I'm not saying they should, it shouldn't. There's plenty of room for everybody. There's plenty of resources for everybody on this planet. Problem is, 10% of the wealth is owned, or 90% of the wealth is owned by 10% of the people. And, you know, a lot of it's hoarded. You know, most of the land, some of these people own, you know, thousands of acres of land that they've never even stepped on, but they don't want anybody else on it either, right? It's like, really, it's, uh, it's, it's just really crazy the way we think. But, you know, the peaceful solution, we can straighten that all out by education. You know, we can actually, if we can get people to think about these simple concepts, like we just went over about abortion, right? Uh, we would see that there's really no, our arguments really don't hold any water. They don't hold any water. They don't make any sense, okay? Um, so anyway, let's continue on the reading on page 51, the second paragraph, it says, can you imagine how your life would be if you had no family or friends? Can you imagine that? What if there was no one to talk to or interact with in any way? Now, I know right now you're probably thinking, man, that sounds great because I really would like to be alone right now. And I don't want to, you know, I just want peace and quiet. And I want that lake I showed, you know, in the first, uh, Slide. I would just want to be out there all by myself and no one to bother me, right? Well, that's nothing wrong with wanting to be by yourself once in a while. I Personally, I like the same thing. But, but what if you needed help? What if you needed a, what if you needed a, you had a medical emergency or what if you needed a haircut or what if you needed a, what if you needed a steak? Do you know how to butcher your own animals? Uh, what if you needed, uh, what if you needed some groceries? Would you be able to produce your own groceries all by yourself? Or would you prefer to be interdependent and have other people that have these specialties so you can go to them to get them? Let's skip the next slide and go to the slide after it. Yeah, okay. Now, remember that picture I showed you of that sea of people on that sidewalk in New York City? Here's New York City if nobody lived there. This is what it would look like in about a thousand years. You see the trees growing out of the buildings? If no one was there to upkeep the city, if you were the only one on earth right now, that's how it would look. <laughs> Do you think you can trim all those trees yourself? Do you think you could maintain all those buildings by yourself? Could you could you do all that by yourself? Man, that would be the strange, would, you know, think about that for a minute. Walking the earth and you're the only one on the earth. Like, you know, 
no. It would be unbearable. It would be so lonely it would be unbearable. Okay? Admit it. You you wouldn't you wouldn't like it. Nobody would like it. It'd be okay for a few minutes, but after you need something or after you want to talk to somebody or you want some you want some uh, companionship or something, forget it. There's nobody there. So when we imagine not being able to interact with anyone, we can begin to comprehend just how valuable human life is. If, if you didn't, you know, if you were cast away on an island somewhere, you know, like Gilligan was, remember? Of course, he had friends on Gilligan's Island, you know. <laughs> but, you know, if you were a castaway and you had a shipwreck on an island and you were the only one on that island, I think after just a couple, couple days, you'd probably really appreciate humans. Because first of all, you'd be waiting for a human to show up, right? To come and rescue you off that island. <laughs> but we all need, we all need people. People need people. There's no doubt about it. Okay, and that's what it says here in the third par paragraph. There's no doubt that people need people. We need to know that someone cares about our health, safety, and well-being in order to have joy and reach our potential, full potential in life. We convey care and concern through positive interactions. Positive interactions. Remember, interactions that are uh, moral, that are, you know, that are, that are kind, compassionate, considerate, etc. For any interaction to be positive, there must be respect. You've got to have respect. And what is respect? Remember what we learned about respect. Let's go back to, I want to go over the meaning of respect again back in the very first part of the book here. Let's go back to page three. It says, uh, respect means to recognize the value of people and things and to treat them with consideration, care, and concern. In other words, just the way we would want to be treated ourselves or we would want our property to be treated or our loved ones to be treated, right? So it says, back to page 51, it says, um, in the previous chapter, we learned about the value of self-respect and how to show respect to yourself. In this chapter, we will continue to explore the value of all human life and how to show respect toward others. How to show respect toward others. Okay, so let's go ahead and turn over to page 52. At the top of the page, it says, I have a responsibility to show respect to everyone. <coughs> Excuse me. Get a drink of water. Uh, okay. So it says in chapter one, we learned that basic respect must be shown to all people and that everyone has a right to be respected. And um, it says, list below the three basic rules of respect for all people. So can you put up the next visual? Because I want to show, uh, we want to go back a little bit to page eight, where it talked about this fundamental respect um, and the basic, the basic uh, rules of respect for all people. On page eight, it showed that you can show appreciation for all people by understanding that there's a fundamental value to life. Keep in mind that appreciation is a part of respect. It helps you to care for others and treat them the way you would like to be treated. And you know, sometimes you really have to take with some people, okay? You really do have to, to take make the effort, like if they're giving you a hard time or you don't like the way they look, <laughs> I don't know what, you know, some people, you know, just rub you the wrong way, okay? And sometimes people you see for the first time, you think, I don't think I'd really want to know that person. But you really, we need to learn to practice looking at that person with the thought in mind of what we're going over right now. Because that person, that person, regardless of whether we know them personally or we're, or whatever, they deserve to be treated the same way we want to be treated. They really do. Regardless of what we think. Regardless of what our little mind is telling us, which is usually going to be opposite of what the peaceful solution says, <laughs> right? We need to remember that they're a, they're a part of the human family. They have value. They have goals. They have dreams. They have uh, hopes. They have family. They have the need to be cared for, respected. They have the need to have uh, 
uh, to live in peace, safety, and security just like you do, regardless of how small they are and what color they are or whatever. It doesn't matter what gender they are. And don't get me started on that because last night I was reading about, what was that? What are they calling women now? <laughs> uh, mothers. They were calling mothers uh, uh, birthing person. <laughs> birthing person. And I'm like, birthing person? Yeah, okay. <laughs> no, I'm sticking with mother, okay? I like that word, okay? I, I think the old-fashioned stuff worked the best, okay? Don't get me to go there with birthing person and all this other stuff with gender, okay? Because I'm not joking, it was actually recently written into a bill that President Biden signed. I think one of the bills, is, it was talking about a mother, is they call mothers now birthing person, you know? They're the ones that can give birth, you know, because the man can't. Yeah, it's called a mom, right? Mom, can we just use mom? <laughs> Let's make it simple. Let's keep it simple. <laughs> we don't need to try anything new, man. Okay, so it says, uh, fundamental respect, back to the slide, it says, fundamental respect for all people is shown when we avoid violent verbal or physical behavior, when we interact with consideration of others' needs, the needs of other people, and when we accept that people are unique and have different beliefs and values. That's one of the biggest deals right there, that People are unique. They're all different. There's, you know, 8 billion people on our planet, and everyone's unique. Everyone's not, there's no one that's the same. And we have different beliefs and values, and that's okay, all right? In other words, you know, I've often wondered how people think that trying to force, and when I say forcing religion, I'm not talking about telling uh you know, talking about your your certain beliefs as far as, you know, what you believe about certain moral convictions. I'm talking about because somebody doesn't go to the same uh, church you do or the same mosque or synagogue or whatever it is that you go to, that you think that somehow imposing pain and suffering on them will endear them to you. <laughs> like, will somehow change the heart and mind to want to befriend you and be uh, one of yours. <laughs> how I don't know how people think that will work, you know. Um, remember how they used to say, uh, I, think, I think my uh, teachers in school used to say, now you know you can win more flies with honey than you can vinegar, you know. <laughs> you, you don't force the people into your belief system. That's not how you do it. And you know, the best way to promote your beliefs, what's the best way to promote them? Yeah, by living them, by actually doing them. And then, and then if people, if they can see the behavior and they see that it's beneficial, they'll say, man, they'll probably come to you and say, hey, why are you so different, you know, than everybody else? Why do you people in the peaceful solution always ask before you touch something? You know, or why do you always write your name and everything that you have? Why does your even your coat have your name on it? You know, I'm not saying you put your name on the front of your coat or anything, but, you know, usually on the label on the back, you know, you have your name in it. You know, why do you all write your name on everything? Well, because we don't want to start a conflict, you know, because somebody might have a coat like mine and try to take mine and there's going to be some kind of dispute. We don't want to have disputes. Why do you people in the peaceful solution, you know, why do you guys always greet one another, you know, kindly? And, you know, why do you all, why do you all, when you have a problem, why do you all try to work it out? Why don't you fight it out? Why don't you all get in a boxing ring, you know, and, and work things out? Why don't you duke it out? <laughs> don't need to. Because we learned something different. Okay? We learned something different. I recently had a, a an acquaintance of mine from high school uh, post something on my Facebook page. I, on my Facebook page, I put peaceful solution quotes, okay? They're not my own quotes. I promote the peaceful solution on my page. And uh, he said, well, how about this hypothetical situation, you know? And <laughs> what's funny about it was he had a his, – his profile picture on Facebook is a crusader emblem, you know, uh, uh, you know, 
Crusader. Uh, uh, I don't know if you, if you know who the Crusaders were, but they were, uh, let's just say they were religious people that were trying to impose their religion on others. <laughs> and uh, <coughs> that's his profile picture. It was a, one of the Crusader horses with the, you know, the horseman with the Crusader shield and all that. And he said, let me give you a hypothetical situation. Because I, I put something up there about don't let the actions of others push your buttons, you know, remain calm, be respectful or whatever. And he said, well, let me give you a hypothetical situation. What if somebody raped your child and, you know, this, 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 and this? Well, I never did answer it. Okay? I didn't answer it. I could answer it, but I didn't answer it because I wanted to think of what I need to tell him. But I can tell you what I would have told him in high school when me and him went to high school together. I guarantee he could tell you what I would have told him. Oh, you need to kill that guy. You need to kill that guy. That's what I would have said. That's what I would have said when I was in high school. But what I want to tell him now, what I want to tell him now is like, you know what? I don't think the same way that I did uh, in 1980, 1979 when I last saw you. When I think it was 1980 or 1981. When I graduated in 81. But I think differently now than I did then. I mean, I, and I've learned that, you know, what would that solve if you, uh, if you retaliate against that person that did you wrong? What I've, in all my years since I last saw you, is what I would tell them, in all my years since I last saw you, I've never seen retaliation work. Never seen it work. I've never seen how getting even uh, solves the problem with anything. Ever. Never. Never seen it. And I would be telling the truth because I've never seen how uh, if somebody disrespects you and you disrespect them in return, how that will solve and create peace between people. I've never seen it. So that's why I think differently because I was educated in the peaceful solution and I see that the way I used to think was I was lacking information. I didn't, I didn't have the information that I needed, you know. And that's probably what I would tell him. I just haven't got around to writing anything yet. I've been too busy doing other things. <laughs> but um, I'm not trying to avoid it. But sometimes we have to think a while before we say things. You're not, we're not obligated to just say something right away. You know, we can wait. We can ponder it. We can think about it. And we can use the peaceful solution to answer that question. And, you know, to me... It's a valid question when you don't know the peaceful solution. Any question is valid, you know. Is there any question that's stupid? No, I beg to differ with you. There is one stupid question. It's the one you don't ask. <laughs> yeah, there you go. Yeah, it's the one we don't ask. It's a stupid question. Because asking helps us to gain information. And information helps us to make, if it's the right information, it helps us to make a perfect decision. Okay, if we gain the right information, we can make a perfect decision about any matter when it comes to morals, etc. All right, <clears throat> so back to um, let's see, I was on. Let's look at the next visual because there were some other basic rules for respecting people on page nine of the respect unit that we're in right now. Um, we showed that basic rules for respecting all people, it says. Always remember that people have value and must be respected because they are living, breathing members of the human race. All right, well, hold on a minute. So you're going to say, well, that baby's not living, that baby's not breathing yet, is he? Well, yes, he is. <coughs> isn't, isn't that, uh, isn't he being provided some kind of oxygen through the mother? Right? And then when he comes out, you know, they, you know, how they, I guess the don't the doctor have to spank him or something to get him to breathe? I don't know. I've I've never been standing there when that took place, but I've I've seen I've seen other visuals. I don't know that it's necessary. Did they spank the baby when they do that? Oh, they got to clear their the phlegm or whatever. Okay, yeah, so the baby can breathe, right? Because it's different breathing. It's a different form of breathing, right? Okay, so. But anyway, so don't say it's not a living, breathing individual because it is. It's a living and it's breathing or it wouldn't even be alive. Um, 
It says, uh, it says basic rules for respecting all people. Also says they have goals, abilities, and potential. Everyone has goals, abilities, and potential. And sometimes we don't see their potential right away. You know, sometimes, you know, uh, I remember I've had a, and I'm not an expert at this, trust me, but I've managed about four or five different offices in my career. And um, I knew the peaceful solution to a certain extent in most, and because I was learning the peaceful solution at the time I was managing in the office. So it did help me big time uh, versus what I would have done had I not known it. Um, but, you know, uh, I was told that if somebody doesn't work well in one area, does that mean that you should fire them? Like, because I remember I was given an opportunity once. I hurt my back. I was a, I was a delivery driver. Uh, in a medical company and you know lifting hospital beds things like that and before that I worked in a furniture store lifting heavy furniture delivering heavy furniture so my back was starting to get pretty bad and I couldn't do any heavy lifting anymore in the warehouse and I thought man I can't tell my boss you know because he's probably gonna fire me you know if I can't do any of this work out here in the warehouse he's probably gonna let me go well, I finally, I couldn't take it anymore. I went in his office and I said, sir, I can't, I'm really having a hard time. I just can't do it anymore. My back is hurting so bad. And he's like, you know, he goes, I noticed you're pretty great with numbers and stuff. He goes, uh, I'd like to try you out in billing, <laughs> right? And he did. He put me in the billing department. I couldn't believe it, you know, because to me, the billers were like, wow, you know, the billers, you know, they're the ones that are, you know, you know, I'm just a peon in the warehouse is how I used to think. And these billers are the ones that are getting all the money, you know. They're all the ones that are billing people, and all they're helping us get paid, you know. And I always looked at them like the elite, you know. And uh, he put me in the billing department, and he had me, uh, and my my supervisor in the billing department came to me and said, here, i got to show you what you're going to be doing. And she took me into this room, and there was this huge stack of files about this high. <laughs> she goes, I go, what am I going to do with those? She goes, file them. And then she showed me a stack of papers that was higher than the files. And she, and I said, what am I going to do with those? And she goes, you're going to put those in the files before you file them? And I'm like, really? <laughs> you know why the stack was so high? No one wants to file in an office. Nobody wants to do filing. That's beneath me, they say. I'm a biller. I don't file anything. The file person files. They just throw the file on the stack and, well, you know what? I took I took the uh, I took the uh, the challenge that my boss gave me, and I went ahead. I started doing the filing, and this is the true a true story. Through filing papers in that those files, through filing papers, I got to read. You know, I got to learn billing codes. I got to learn all these different things about Medicare and Medicaid and billing. Just through filing those papers, because everything had to be in chronological order in the file. Everything had to be, you know, just perfect. I learned billing codes. I learned everything I needed to know about how to bill an insurance company or Medicare or Medicaid. I learned all the Medicare codes and rules through billing. And within a year and a half, I opened my own consulting company. <laughs> I'm not bragging. I'm just saying. Because I chose to go ahead and do that menial job that no one wanted to do. I got to learn more things than the people that were in that office even knew that were in the billing department because, you know, billers have their own specific jobs they do. They don't know everything about that job that other guy's doing over there but when you're doing the billing you get to learn about all the different aspects so but i learned through through that through that example that my boss gave me when i started managing offices that just because somebody's not proficient in one area doesn't mean you need to get rid of them it just means you might want to move them somewhere else like 
move them around till you can find what they are great at doing, right? But you don't fire them. You don't need to fire them unless they're like insubordinate and they just don't want to, you know, they want to just make trouble for the company or whatever. That's one thing. But if they really want to work and they really might not be well at one thing, they might be great at something else. So move them around a little bit. See where they fit in. <clears throat> and that's where, you know, everyone has abilities and potential. So back to the slide on the basic rules. The last one says... They can build a positive character and be productive members of society. And that's really the most important thing we need to remember about everybody is, you know, they can be the worst person on earth, which I consider myself to be before I learned the peaceful solution. I, I considered myself to be incorrigible. It wasn't just the judges that thought that. <laughs> I thought the same thing. Okay. I thought, you know, I'm, I'm never going to be able to stay out of trouble you know, 10 minutes, man, you know, I'm never going to be able to, this is what I used to think until I learned the peaceful solution. And, you know, everybody, no matter how, what situation they're in right now, I don't care if they're a cartel member and they've been murdering people, they've been dropping bodies and acid or whatever, it doesn't matter. If they're taught, you give them the right teacher, the right environment, the right information and, the, and an opportunity and if they want to learn, you can actually turn that person around. Okay? It's like uh, Yisrael Hawkins, the author of The Peaceful Solution, said you can take some guy out on the street corner that's got his pants halfway down and he's slinging dope out there and selling dope on the street corner and, you know, uh, <coughs> got his boom box on his shoulder blasting real loud. You can take that guy and you can get him in a classroom or you know, over the internet here and give them the right information and plant some seeds of uh, the peaceful solution character education program in that person's mind, and you can actually change the heart and mind of that person. They just need the right information, and they need an opportunity. They need an opportunity, they need the right environment, and they need a teacher that's capable and that's willing to help them, okay? We can't sit there and say, well, those people are never going to change if we're not willing to do something to help them change. You're right. They're not going to change if we don't do something to help them. You're right. You're right. We're never going to have peace on this earth if we don't do anything to to get the message out there and we don't get out there and, and practice a peaceful solution in our own sphere of influence. You're right. We won't have it. But nothing comes by osmosis. Have you noticed that? <laughs> Sitting on your can, you're going to get the job done? That's never worked for me. Uh, back to the slide, it says, each person has goals, desires, and the potential to contribute something of value to the needs of others. <coughs> the peaceful solution. So everybody in this er, on this earth has that potential, uh, whether, we, whether we can see them or whether we can't. doesn't matter. Remember that. So remember the three basic rules of respect for all people on page 52 before we stop tonight is be polite and courteous. Recognize the value and worth of all people and accept that people are unique and have different beliefs and values. And that's okay, you know. That's okay, you know. Um, we're going to stop there on page 52. We'll pick up there right underneath uh, on that second paragraph there. And uh, the next class, the next class will be on 3-5-2023 at 5.30 p.m. Central Standard Time. We thank you for joining us this evening, and we hope to see you again in the next class. Everyone have a great evening.